Welcome to Man and Science. Today we'll learn about microscopes and biodiversity and NGSS, Next Generation Science Standards, cross-cutting concepts. This lab has it all. We'll get to explore our world, make connections, have fun, and see the most amazing things. Let's break up this lab investigation into three parts. Scavenger phase, microscope mania phase, and our connections phase. Keep in mind, there is more information along with helpful links in the description below. This includes the link to get the full lab write-up that can be found on Pocket Lab Notebook. And hey, while you're at it, you know, uh, maybe consider subscribing. We'll begin with the scavenger phase. To start, you'll need to get out into nature. Go find some cool stuff to look at. Use this as your guide. Ask yourself, is this something rad to look at? And would it be even more rad to look at under the microscope? If the answer is yes, keep it. Let fun and curiosity guide you. Places you might want to look. Your backyard, a park, your school, a garden, especially flowers. Get creative. Go climb a tree, snorkel a spring, dig in the dirt. I pulled out the microscopes and one of the last things I looked at was a tick that was on my leg. You can use prepared slides, like so. You can gather up bark with lichens on it, pretty flowers of all shapes and sizes, and probably the coolest thing you can get would be some pond or lake water, something with some muck in it. So we'll take just a little pipette. You can see in there all sorts of stuff inside. This can be looked at primarily with a wet mount slide using a light optical microscope. Following the scavenger phase, we'll move into the microscope mania phase. Take a look at some of the materials that you'll need for this lab. To start, you're gonna need some microscopes. We've got a regular compound light microscope. We got a binocular dissecting scope. You can see these have their own light sources, although they could be used out in the field potentially. I've also got with me a fold scope. This is a really cool option you might have in your classroom or that you could buy where it's basically made out of paper, really small, portable, field and cheap microscopes. What else are you gonna want? You're gonna wanna have access to your phone, both for viewing things, recording it. It might help also to have an adapter for your phone. So you can hook this thing up to a microscope and then a phone can be tightened in here and you can view and record straight to your device. Another quick tip for teachers is that you could use this to project onto your board or your smart board. We'll start where most good learning begins, with play and exploration. Simply look around at your specimens, check them out under different magnifications, look at your friends' specimens. Now this all assumes that you know how to properly use a microscope. I can't see anything. Use your open eye, Frank. Oh, yeah, I can see it now. If you need a refresher, hang tight right here. If you're comfortable and proficient, feel free to skip ahead. Remember, using a microscope is a skill. And like playing the piano or reading or shooting a basketball, it requires practice. So here's what you've got. If we take a look closely at a compound light microscope, we've got our eye or ocular lens. In some microscopes, you'll see that this actually comes out. These are almost always 10x, meaning it multiplies what you're looking at by 10 or makes it 10 times bigger. This one has two of them, so you can look at it with both eyes at the same time. This one has one. You want to practice keeping your eyes both open to avoid eye strain, although surely you could do it with just one eye open. 
you have a base and a stage, you're going to want to start with your stage all the way down. And you've got maybe one, two, three, or in this case, four different objective lenses. You can see and hear them click into spot. In the case of the dissecting scope, you can change your magnification right here and your focus right here. In this case, the actual lenses move. In this case, the stage moves. You can see this one also has some clamps where you can fasten the slide. Notice I just put a tick on a piece of tape right here. You could, if the specimen were thin enough, just put it directly on there, although some people aren't big fans of that. I could put that here and look and see how beautiful that is. You'll always want to start under the lowest magnification, basically the farthest away, the least close in. This gives you the lowest magnification, but the greatest range or breadth of view. So I start on the lowest. And if I just take my tick and put it on here, and I can see the full specimen, what you'll do is begin by moving the stage closer to you. Now, once you have it under the best focus you can get with the large knob or course adjustment, you will do something finer with the fine adjustment. And this gets it even more dialed in. What you'll notice with everything you look at is that it's 3D, so you can focus on different layers. Obviously, the bigger the thing that you're looking at, the more layers you can focus on. Something like a leaf, or if you had something 3D like this fig, well, you could take a slice and look at it under the regular light microscope, but this will suit you better by looking at it under a dissecting scope. So the more 3D it is, and the bigger, the more likely you are to use a dissecting scope. Okay, once you have it dialed in, in this case, we've got 10X and a 4X, and these magnifications can be multiplied. So 10 times 4 is 40. I'm going to move over to, in this case, 10X. Notice that you typically don't look at something on a piece of tape. You might look at an actual slide. If you're looking at a slide, you'll see that it fits in here, and it has a holder, which allows you to do more precise movements. The other thing this will do is allow you to potentially measure things on your microscope. So if I move this over, I can move it up and back. I can also adjust my focus. Now, once it's already dialed in with course adjustment, you can leave it there and just make fine adjustments using fine adjustment. Some microscopes underneath are going to have a diaphragm where you can adjust the amount of light that comes in and other fancy tools. In this case, once it's under 10 times 10 or 100 magnification, you can go to higher up and some of them allow you to do oil immersion. Either way, the main goals of this would be get your specimen secured, start at farthest away and lowest power, and then work your way up. And the same thing here, start far away and scoot in. And if I'm looking at lichen that is on this tree bark, well, it's very 3D. And so you can move through layers as you go. After 10 or so minutes exploring, it's time to start recording what you see. Common practice has students drawing a picture of their sample inside of a circle. Along with the drawing, you'll want to include what it is that you're looking at. So examples would be lichen on tree bark, or a tick, or a fig leaf, or fungal spores, in this case of a prepared slide. You want to include the power. That would mean, in this case, 4 times 10, which is 40, or 10 times 10, which is 100. You want to take down some notes and key features and potential questions. Once you've gone through the prescribed number of stations and specimens, and you've completed and labeled your drawings, you move on to phase three. Phase three is all about making connections. And it has two parts. 
The first set of connections will have you consider the biodiversity of your biological samples. So take a look and see if you can label what kingdom it's from. Now note, back from the scavenger phase, you might want to reverse engineer this step and make sure you collect as broad a diversity of samples as possible. Basically, as much as we all love plants, you want to try to have not only leaves and flowers. Additionally, teachers can supplement with their own samples and prepared slides. The second and final part of phase three connections is where you practice thinking about and using your cross-cutting concepts from NGSS. Here are the seven cross-cutting concepts. They're all applicable to this investigation, but no doubt scale is the most direct connection. For each specimen, consider which cross-cutting concepts are best illustrated and exemplified. Here's an example for you. If you look closely at our pond water, you might think, oh my goodness, there are a ton of little organisms zipping around. And you might wonder about this scale. Are these single-celled organisms? Are they multiple-celled organisms? From earlier, you're looking at and considering what kingdom they're from. Are they animal? Are they plants? Are they protists? You might notice the exuberance of these guys. Perhaps it gets you thinking about the flow of energy and the cycling of matter in an ecosystem. Or maybe you stop and consider the scale and proportion of these single-celled creatures you find. Try counting them up and you'll be connected to quantity. Just a quick reminder, all this is written up for you in lab form on Pocket Lab Notebook. You can find the link in the description below. I'd love to hear how this lab goes for you. What kinds of things did you look at? What did you wonder? How did you improve this lab to make it better? Keep exploring, everybody. See you here next time.